And then the Greek language comes out with another word. It is the word agape. And agape is more than romantic love. Agape is more than friendship. Agape is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. And when one rises to love on this level, he is able to love the person who does the evil deed while hating the deed that the person does. And he is able to love those persons that he even finds it difficult to like. For he begins to look beneath the surface and he discovers that that individual who may be brutal toward him who, and who may be prejudiced was taught that way, he was a child of his culture. At times his school taught him that way, at times his church taught him that way, at times his family taught him that way. And the thing to do is to change the structure and the evil system so that he can grow and develop as a mature individual de devoid of prejudice. And do to us what you will, and we will still love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. And so throw us in jail, and as difficult as it is, we will still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children, and as difficult as it is, we will still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our communities at the midnight hours and drag us out on some wayside road and beat us and leave us half dead, and we will still love you. But be ye assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer, and one day we will win our freedom, but we will not only win freedom for ourselves, we will so appeal to your heart and your conscience that we will win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. And so with this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mounting of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning to you once again, Bethel family that's here in the sanctuary and those that are online today. We hope that your day is progressing in a way Amen. that you're progressing in God. Amen. Amen. You know, we take this time each year to... <laughs> recognize one of our great leaders the great Reverend Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And his birthday will be celebrated nationally on tomorrow. And so we want to take time to recognize it as well. You know, one of Dr. King's greatest quotes, you just saw it up there, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love. Can do that. You just heard in the video where he mentioned agape love. You know, that's the love that comes from God. It's the God kind of love. You know, and God's love is perfect, and, and he models love for us, and we are in turn supposed to share that love to other people. I can imagine, you know, during the civil rights, those years, I wasn't, I, I, you know, if I was around, I was so young, I don't understand what was going on, but I, I can imagine that during that time, it was difficult to extend that love, but yet love was still what had to be extended even in those moments when things weren't lovely. We've overcome a great deal since Dr. Martin Luther King passed away, but the challenge remains for us to demonstrate the God kind of love. 
Because we are supposed to demonstrate that love now, right? That's the love. What is the God kind of love? It's the love that was spoken about in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. If you're trying to figure out, God, what is this love, that, 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 this agape love, this God kind of love? It's a, it's a love that's patient, a love that's kind, it's a love that doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, it's a love that doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking and it's not easily angered. Keeps no records of wrong. I'm going to remember it. And it does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It's the kind of love that never fails. No matter what, that love is going to survive. And this is not the love of the world. Because that's not the love of the world. That's not how the love of the world is founded, and that's not how it's based. That's the love that only comes from God, because it's a love that is without conditions. It's a love that's without boundaries. It's a love that is selfless and sacrificial. How many of you have that kind of love? Working on it. We all are work in progress. As long as you're working on it and you haven't settled in some of those old ways, then that means you're moving forward. It's a love that is available to each of us as we make ourselves available to God. Amen? You know, being available to God is the focus for this year, and we are continuing in our available series today, and I'm just excited about the focus that God has given us in this year because it's so much wrapped up into that one little word. You know, our availability encompasses everything about us, our abilities, our purpose, even our service to the kingdom is wrapped up in our availability. Remember, we learned last week that being available means that you're ready for immediate use. What does that mean? That means that there is no pause. There's no contemplation. There's no time that we take to say, okay, let me, let me see if I can bargain with God or let me see if I can figure out a way to finagle myself out of what God is calling me to do. Now, I might step on somebody's toes in a few minutes, but I'm not trying to. But I want you to think about something, because sometimes, you know, listen, it's good to pray about circumstances and situations. I would encourage you to pray. But I also encourage you not to use prayer If I step on your toe, just say, ouch. Don't use prayer as an object to give you time to figure out how to say no. About something you've been asked to do. Do you know what I mean? Let me pray about it. One week done passed. Two weeks done passed. Three weeks done. You still praying? You ain't heard God yet. But then you he's the on time. God, he's right here. Yes, he is. And you oh, I can hear from God. But when you want to hear God right away, we hear God right away. But we trying to. Immediate use. You know, last week I stood here and as our worship team was leading us in that song, Make Room, and I, I was just overwhelmed. Some of you might have noticed I, I had my, my little handkerchief. I was wiping tears away from my eyes and I wish you could have seen the view that I saw. I saw so many individuals with their hands lifted up to God. And they were making this declaration to God, not to me, but to God. Say, Lord, I, 
Lord, I, I make room for you to do what you want to do. And I was just overwhelmed. They were saying, God, I'm available to you. God, your, your way is better than my way. I wish you could have seen what I saw when I was standing up here. I wish you could have seen at the end of service, even after many of you began to leave, there, were, there was a group of people that still were standing here. Lord, I'm available. I'm making room for you to do what you want to do. How many of you still hold into that declaration? I hope that this wasn't a moment from last week, but you, you, the, you, this has become a way of life now. I'm holding on to this, and every day, God, I want you to know I'm making room for you. You are my priority, God, that I'm available for your use. See, that's our posture for this year, being available to God. First, what is available? Being ready for immediate use. That means when God calls you to something, you're not going, oh, I got to take some time to figure it out. You don't need to figure out what God has already If God gives you something specific to do, Ain't nothing for you to figure out. Just be like Isaiah and say, here am I, send me. And begin to walk in that thing. Matter of fact, we, we're about to enter into a, a, a moment or a time of corporate fasting and praying, and we're going to start on Tuesday. And, 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 and as a matter of fact, being available is, 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 is our main focus in this prayer. Why? Don't you realize that being available to God, your yes to God opens up every other pathway? Don't you understand when you tell God that, Lord, I, 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 I'm, I'm saying yes to you. Everything else is going to fall into place when you put yourself in the right position in God. And when you make yourself available to him, then he's going to open up your understanding for everything else. He's going to pour into you and open up windows and open up doors in every area that we're seeking him for. The thing you have to understand, if you don't make room for God, guess what? It's going to be something competing for your mind, for your time, for your talents. Your attention is always going to be on something. Nobody is walking around with that thing over their head and in the middle of that circle is nothing there. <laughs> Somebody said, well. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what we have to do. That's where our focus needs to be. Being available to God. You're going to receive an email and it's going to have the prayer points and focus and all that throughout the next two weeks. And we invite you to come. Noonday, Monday through Thursday, with an exception of tomorrow. Come and spend a few moments praying in the corporate body. Would you do that? You'll be blessed for doing so. So we're going to go to our, our main scripture for this series and for our focus. It's not just a series because this is our focus being available to God. And of course, it's found in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, verses eight. Now, come on, we're going to stand up and read that one together. This is a, you know, whatever our main focus is, we want to make sure we want you to get that in your heart and your spirit so that you can, you can know this text and that you can always call on it. And not only call on it, but it begins to speak to you and you truly understand what it's saying especially as you're using it as a model and a guide into this year. And it should be on the screen as well. What does it say? It says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. 
send me. Come on, let's say that last part one more time. Here am I, send me. Come on, one more time. Here am I, send me. Take your seat. God heard you. Oh, Pastor, I was just reading. Uh Uh-huh. You know, sometimes the Lord, he extends invitations to us and, you know, to us as a body of believers. And he, 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 but the invitation that he extends to us requires a response. See, when you get an invitation, you got to respond to it. RSVP, respond to the invitation so they can know if you're going to be a part. Why do we have to respond to it? We got to respond to it so that the will of God will be accomplished in the earth through us. So if we don't respond, if we don't make ourselves available, then how can God's will be accomplished if we don't say, here am I, send me. See, see, the prophet Isaiah's immediate response was just that. You know, it, it stands as an as a, as a, as a, a, a example for all of us to follow. What happens when God says, I I need you, I got something for you to do. He didn't hesitate, he didn't contemplate, he didn't say, God, I'll be right back, let me go in my prayer closet and see. But he said, here am I, send me. (laughs) If you go back and read uh, 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 verses one through seven in Isaiah six, and you can do that, I'm not gonna uh, gonna go through those right now. You'll find that, 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 that Isaiah, he found himself in the presence of the holy God. And it made him painfully aware of something. Made him painfully aware of his own sinful state. See, we get in God's presence. We shouldn't just enter into his presence any kind of way. We should realize, oh, we're in the presence of the holy God. Verse 5, he cried out, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips. He, he understood that, oh, God, you, you're in my, I'm in your presence, and I, I'm so unworthy to be in your presence. He didn't just come into his presence any kind of way and say, okay, God, here I am. But he understood the holiness of God. See, I believe that Isaiah, he had a vision of God in all his glory, and he, and he began to, 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 to compare it, his holiness to his, his sinfulness, and he became overwhelmed. He's like, oh my gosh, how can I even stand in his presence? How can he call on me? He felt so unworthy. See, when we envision the true holiness of God, that should be our posture. Sometimes we should, we walk into this place, we should come into here, oh God. We shouldn't even walk into the God's house any kind of way. But we should walk in God's house with a reverential spirit, God, because I know I'm entering your place, God, of holiness. I'm coming where I know your presence is going to be. Every time we come, every time we get up and every time we come this way, before you come, you should be saying, oh, God, search me, God, make sure. God, when I get into your presence today, it's nothing, God, that's going to hinder me from hearing your voice. But in the same time, it should prompt us to be grateful. that our almighty, holy God and Father, creator of all things, instead of him condemning us, to the death that we deserve, he instead cleans us up and invites us to be a part of his kingdom. Now, 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 Maybe y'all weren't born in sin. Because when I think about God and I think about his holiness and I think about the life that I was living and I think about how 
One day he, 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 he wrapped his arms around me and he snatched me out of that situation and out of my old way of living. And he, brand, he made me brand, he cleaned me up and he made me brand new. And not only that, he didn't clean me up and say, okay, now you go sit down on the bottom step. No, he said, no, I want you to come and join my kingdom and walk with me and be an heir and a joint heir. Maybe I just got a different kind of understanding because when I think about that kind of thing, I just can't contain myself sometimes. It's like I'm, I'm just about to lose my mind because of the goodness of God, a holy God. <laughs> that despite our feeling unworthy, he He still said, I got use for you. But you got to make yourself available for me. And we got to be like Isaiah. We just got to say, here I am. Send me. How many of you have been testifying in that? How many of you have been asking God? Lord, saying, God, here I am. The thing about it is this. The moment you begin to tell God, I'm available for you, and say, God, here I am, send me. Oh, he got an assignment for you. That's why sometimes we ain't saying that. Because we know when we do it, God's going to give you the assignment. And then one or two things are going to happen. Either you're going to step into it, or you're going to walk around guilty because you know you're not doing what God called you to do. I would encourage you to just say, here I am, and go do it. But, but for the next few moments, I, I want to focus our attention on, 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 on some more verses of this text here. I want to focus on uh, 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 verse 9 and 10 of Isaiah chapter 6. Because so often uh, when you hear messages that come from this, this, this area of availability and here I am, send me, that's where it stops. But I want us to look a little further. Look at verse 9. It says this, he said, this is Isaiah talking, this is what God was telling him. Go and tell this people. Remember, he said, here I am, send me. And the moment that he said, here I am, send me, God began telling him what he wanted him to do. Are you available? Go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their eyes dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. You see, see, see what has happened here in verse 8, God extended an invitation and Isaiah responded with immediate availability. God, here I am. Send me. But after he made himself available, God entrusted him with an assignment. He was going to take a message from God to the people. Now, if you keep reading all through uh, chapter 6, you'll find out that, that, that he was going to take a message to people that wouldn't understand it, didn't want to hear it, weren't going to believe it. Their eyes wouldn't be open. They didn't want to receive the truth of the, the beauty of, uh, of the, the message that he was going to bring to them. But yet, here I am. Could you imagine? Just imagine you for a moment. You, you're going and you're delivering a message, knowing in advance that the very people that you're taking the message to going to reject you and your message. How did it make you feel? Do you still go? 
Do you still deliver the message with the same compassion? Do you go with an attitude? Or do you decide, I ain't going because they don't want to hear it anyway? See, we need to come to this realization. Everybody is not going to receive the message. Everybody is not going to receive you. Some people are going to reject you and your message. But yet, it doesn't change the fact that God has called you. See, something you got to understand. All he told you to do was deliver the message. He didn't tell you to work it out. He didn't tell you to. He said, just go do what I tell you to do. See, sometimes we got to stop trying to put ourselves in God's place. <laughs> so, so, so what does this passage do? It reminds of a, of a couple of things. First, it reminds us that sharing the gospel is an honor. Amen. Oh, sometimes it may not seem like it, it and sometimes it, Oh, God, sometimes it seems like it's so hard, but you know what? It's an honor and a privilege to share this gospel message, to proclaim it on behalf of God. Do you realize that God has, has cleaned us up, pulled us up out of a stinking, sinful state? And then he said, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to just make you second class, but now I'm going to give you the message that my son I want you to carry the message. Man, what an honor. Sometimes we feel more honored about all kind of stuff that don't make a, a difference when it comes to your eternal being. But it's such an honor and a privilege to go and share the gospel message of Jesus. See, you got to understand something. When we go, because you, you're only doing what God called you to do, all you're going to do is share it with confidence, knowing this. Knowing that anybody, see anybody, anybody. that puts their trust in the Lord, repents, and turns from their sin, they can be saved. That's enough right there to make you have such a joy about going and share the message. Because if they receive the message their life is going to be changed. Romans 10, 13 lets us know, whoever calls on the Lord shall be saved. <laughs> that means this, they call on the Lord and they experience this, 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 this reconciliation, this reconciled relationship now with God. They receive something from him, some gifts. They receive the gift of forgiveness. They get spiritual salvation. And guess what? A caveat on the end of it, you get eternal life. See, it's not just about your salvation. But I say all the time, see, sometimes in the church, there's a thing called selfish salvation. I got mine, you got to get yours. I'm on my way to heaven. And, and they don't worry about who else is lost. But God didn't give us a selfish salvation. He told us to go and tell everybody. And throughout the scriptures, you find every time Jesus did something, he, he look, they wanted to hang with him. He told go back to your own people, go back where you came from. Why? Because he wanted people to go and wanted them to see what God had done. You can't get saved and go home and lock yourself behind your door and don't let nobody know what God did for you. See, 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 this process of reconciliation is, 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 is simple. It's a simple process. But it's something about it. 
The thing about reconciliation is this. It can't happen unless people believe in Christ. Guess what else? They won't believe in Christ if they don't hear the message. Guess what else? They won't hear the message unless somebody tell them. See, you think it's just going to happen by osmosis? No, it don't happen that way. Oh, yeah. God, he want everybody to be saved. But somebody got to go and tell them. And if the church ain't telling them, if the body of Christ is not delivering the message, who going to tell them? Romans 10, 14, 15 says this. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? <laughs> and how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? And how will anybody, how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? What are we just talking about? Here am I. Ooh, I ain't here but two people. Ooh. Here am I. Send me. That is why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Look at your feet. Look at your feet. Look at your feet. Now, say, I'm that messenger. See, y'all think it only comes from the pulpit. No. See, 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 we all have been sent. We all been sent by God. Not to share our words, but to, but to, but to speak the message of God to those that are lost. Because see, our words don't have no weight. They can't change nobody. See, without the power of the Holy Spirit and, 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 and us giving the message of God, nobody's going to change. Our words can't open nobody's eyes up. Our words can't change nobody's heart. Our words can't reconcile nobody to God, but the Word of God can. All we got to do is be His faithful representatives in the earth that make themselves available to God to use to do that work. And guess what? The Holy Spirit gonna do the rest. All you're doing is planting the seed. It's just like when you put a seed in the ground. When you put the seed in the ground, you don't make it grow. But if you don't ever put the seed in the ground, buy a bag of seeds and put them on the shelf. You're going to have a bag of seeds. Those seeds don't do anything until they're planted. And if you're not planting a message in somebody's heart, guess what? They just like the bag of seeds that you never ripped open to pour into the ground. <laughs> See, we got one job. You got one job. One job. One job. Guess what your one job is? Boy, if this was a test, how many would pass the test? You got one job, and your one job is to share the gospel. Now, I dare you to look at somebody and ask them how you own your job. 
Did they answer? You got one job. Whew. Isaiah 69 through 10 also serves as a reminder that God often stretches us beyond what we think is possible. See, I think that's sometimes why we, we're afraid to step out and say, God, here I am, because we're looking at our own abilities and we're looking at our own limitations and we're saying, oh, I can't do that. That's a good place to be. Because God's going, he's going to stretch you beyond. See, there's something about God. He always calls us to tasks that are greater than our abilities. And I believe he does that on purpose. One, he's trying to show you that it ain't about you. And two, he's trying to show you that, that, that your abilities in his hand don't have no limitations. See, when he calls us, it's not based on our abilities. I told you last week, it's based on your availability. When he calls you, are you available for him? He didn't ask you to do nothing. He didn't tell you to go, to go do this, go do that, get ready, come back. No, are you available? And if you're feeling insufficient for the call of God on your life, guess what? You're in good company. Because you're not alone. Let me show you, let me show you. We can look through the scriptures and we find numerous examples of, of the saints of God that did the same thing. They, they got an assignment and they didn't, didn't believe that their ability, to, oh, God, this assignment is too big for me. I, I can't do it. Look, we can go all the way back to the beginning. of Go to Exodus. Moses. Moses was called from the solitude of a, a call, call, call from solitude to a daunting task. He was just minding his business. And guess what? From a burning bush. Now, I can imagine Moses, when he got his call, boy, there had to be something because not only did he get a call that was beyond his belief in what I can do, but he, he, he getting it from a bush that's burning but not being consumed. What did God do? He gave him the responsibility of delivering all of Israel from Egypt. Woo, that's a daunting task. And when he gave him that assignment, what happened? He won't enthuse. He won't like, oh, God, yes, God, yeah. Woo. No, he didn't have no enthusiasm about the Why? Because he felt inadequate and ill-prepared to do. As a matter of fact, he began to question God. Woo, how many of us do that? God, you, God, you want me to do? You want me to do what? What did he do? He started asking God, God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? It's in there. Go to Exodus third chapter. You'll see it. Then later on, God, after God spoke to him about that, then he's going to turn around and say, God, I can't even talk. I'm slow of speech. My tongue get tangled up. His abilities were limited, but not God's ability to use him to do what he wanted him to do. And what happened? Even though he had limited abilities, God used him to work miracle after miracle after miracle. He parted the Red Sea, and guess what happened? All the children of Israel walked across safely. Why? Because he made himself available to God. See, 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 like many of us, look, look, Moses, uh, he had some abilities that, that, that he didn't even, he didn't understand. He, didn't, he wasn't aware of. You know why he wasn't aware of them? 
Because God was going to stretch those things. He was going to use abilities that he had within him beyond what he understood because that's God. And God is trying to do the same thing for you and for me. Sometimes it's just a matter of uh, realizing what we got in our hands. See, sometimes we got what we need. But because we're so blind to thinking that we don't have what we need, we short-circuit ourselves. What did he have? He just had a staff. He had a shepherd's tool. A stick. That's what it was. But in Moses' hands, God used that shepherd's tool as an instrument of his power. Moses used it to help him walk. He might have used it to, 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 to get some sheep back in place. But God used it as a powerful tool. Moses' hands, his staff became a serpent. Why? Because God was using something that we limited, he limited for his glory. In Moses' hand, he took that same piece of wood and struck a rock and got water. In Moses' hand, he took that same piece of wood, that staff, and touched the sea, and the water began to move back out the way. What's in your hands? What abilities have God given you that you haven't released to him to let him do what he wants to do with? See, what God would do, he would take the ordinary and turn it to something extraordinary if we give it to him. See, understand something, it doesn't matter how great or insignificant it may seem to you, but in God's hands, it becomes an instrument of power, uh, of extraordinary power, because it's God. Consider Esther. Young Jewish girl became the queen of Persia. She, she was given a task. And her task was, was life-threatening. See, 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 there had been, an, been a, a decree made. They were going to kill all the Jews. She was a Jew. And so she, she's in this position now. Here it is. God didn't give you something. She got it right in her hands, and, 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 but it seems so limited. Oh, if I go to the king and he had not invited me, I can lose my life. But Mordecai let her know something. See, 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 sometimes we just need somebody to come and tap you on the shoulder and say, well, don't worry about that, God said. He let her know. You're not in this position just because you, you want to be laying up beside the king. Or you might be in this position for such a time as this because God's going to use you. So what happened? She grabbed hold to some courage. And she went. And she spoke to the king. And as a result of her obedience, guess what? The whole nation was saved. Who out there hasn't been saved yet because you haven't accepted? Who out there is still lost because you haven't stepped out and said, God, here am I, send me? One of my favorites, David. There's a whole lot I can say about him. Shepherd boy that was called to be a king. But before he was called to be a king, he had an assignment. And his assignment was one that, that, that whoo, just to look at it from the natural eyes, oh, oh, he's not going to win this. Because he was given the assignment to go up against a giant with a slingshot and some rocks. Don't make sense, does it? <laughs> with some rocks and a slingshot, the mighty Philistine warrior, champion, 
feared every man, everybody feared him. Never tasted defeat. He didn't know what it meant to not be victorious. He laughed at those who stood before him until he came up against this little shepherd boy that was on an assignment by God. See, when he, 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 when he was faced with this little boy with that slingshot and rock, that won't do ordinary slingshot and rock. That was a rock sent from the Holy Ghost. That was a rock that was sent by the power of God. And it won't come return void. It was going to accomplish what it was sent to do. And that was to defeat the enemy. To show them that God is greater. How many giants stand in front of you and God has already given you everything you need to tell the giant to bow down and get out the way? You can just knock the giant down, but you standing back. I can't do that. That's too much for me. It's too great. Another example. There's so many examples. I'm going to share one more. Paul. Here's Paul. He was once the chief persecutor of the church. He was, uh, he was the Christian's worst enemy. But yet he became one of the greatest apostles that God used. Wrote many of the books of the New Testament. was so instrumental in spreading the gospel to the Gentiles. But you know what? He had some things in his hands. He was educated. He was articulate. He, he was passionate about what he did. See, that's why he was considered to be the church chief persecutor. He was passionate about what he did. But oh, one day he met God. He met Jesus Christ on, on the Damascus Road and his life changed. And from that moment, he, he had that same posture. Here am I, send me. It doesn't matter what I have to go through. I can go to jail. I can go through whatever, whatever trials and tribulations, God. I'm available to you. See, his education, God used it. See, he can debate with those philosophers. He, he, knew they, he knew what they knew. As a matter of fact, now that he got God on his side, he knew more than they knew. See, sometimes we act like we're scared. Read the Bible. God will give you understanding. Then you can go and you can talk on God's behalf. That's why David said, I, well, uh, God, I, I hear your word in my heart. See, it got to be in there in order for you to be a... Look, Paul couldn't go to those philosophers talking about, let me go back and find my book. Let me go get my scroll right quick and see what, what you're talking about. No, he knew exactly what to say. He used it to preach powerful messages, to birth churches. Man, how many things are lying dormant because the body of Christ hasn't stepped into what God has called them to step into? It's time to make ourselves available to God. See, Paul understood something. He understood that his gifts and his abilities were not his. He knew that they were gifts that God gave him. And so he gave them back to God. Lord, you use these things that you've given me to advance your kingdom, to do your work. That's what God is trying to get us to see. Every last one of us has something God can use. But you got to avail it. You got to give it to him. And then you got to be obedient to what he tells you to do. See, it's not about how much you got. But it's about how much you're willing to let God use. So you can have a whole lot of education and understanding. But if God ain't using it,
It's just a good to have. But when we surrender all of our abilities to God, then God can do something with that. He can do something with that. And, and, and it'll, it'll be an instrument of power beyond what you could even imagine God will do. And see, 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 whether, whether it was Moses and his staff or think about Esther and her courage, David had faith. Because when he stood before Goliath, he wasn't worried about him. He told, oh, you're going to fall. Paul used his education, everything about him. To advance God's kingdom. Because what God does is this. He equips us for the call. He ain't putting you out there unprepared. He going to give you what you need if you give him all. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 9 and 8, and I'm almost done. God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you point to yourself. That's talking about you. Have always having all sufficiency in all things. That means you ain't lacking nothing. May have an abundance for every good work. What's the good works? The things that God is calling you to. He said, this, you're going to be sufficient in all of it. You're going to have an abundance. You're going to have everything you need. You're not going to be lacking nothing. To do what God has called you to do. He don't leave us to fend for ourselves. He's with us. He provides for us. He enables us. He, he wants us to finish the assignment. He don't give us an assignment for to go sit on a shelf. He gives us an assignment to be accomplished. But we got to make ourselves available. You can look, look, just look at somebody and tell them you got to make yourself available. It was easy to say that, wasn't it? Now you say, I got to make myself available. Oh, that makes it a little more personal now. It's easy to do this. It's a little harder to do this. Because it makes you have to do something now. Sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that our abilities and our, you know, is what makes us stand out. No, it don't. <laughs> See, in God's kingdom, it's not your ability, but your availability is what makes you somebody in his kingdom. Because you've made yourself available to God so he, now he can use you to bring himself glory. This morning I was up and I was just praying. And team, you can come on back on the stage. And I was praying this morning. I was downstairs in a den by myself. And I just kept thinking about what I, when I viewed. Everybody last week, when we were singing, make room. And so I found myself sitting downstairs by myself, saying, Lord, I'll make room for you. Whatever you want to do, God, I'm available to you. Because I understand, God, your way is better. And I kept saying this thing over and over and I, 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 over again. To the point when my wife came downstairs a little later, she said, honey, we, we can't be late today. But I was just in this moment, God, I just... See, I don't know about you, but I realized that there's no greater call to answer than the call of God upon your life. Greater than your job, greater than your career, greater than when you find the one that you're going to spend your life with. The call of God is the greatest call you can ever answer. That's why I shared the stories of Moses and Esther and 
Paul and David. They just made themselves available. And because of the availability, God did great things through them to bring him glory. It may not even be clear to some of you what God is calling you to do. The only thing you have to remember is this, it's not about your ability, but it's about your availability. And if you just say yes to God, He'll show you. He'll show you. My encouragement to you today is to make yourself available to God and he will reveal to you. Think about it. Moses. Got the call of God. From a burning bush. David got the call of God out there in the sheep field. Esther was in the palace. Paul on Damascus Road. I don't know where your call is going to come. But when it comes, you need to say, God, here am I. I'm available for you. Send me.